recognizes that it no more holds the monopoly over religion and faith. And therefore, it does what it has done in every other country, which is it starts digesting its competitors. Okay? So it starts inviting the monks to become members of the church and they are given high positions. And that's also to address the debauchery and the corruption that had by then entrenched itself in the church establishment. Then comes a point around the 12th century where I think it's under Pope Gregory that a tussle starts between the ruler, so to speak, and the church in terms of who will control the church's property. So the church chooses to invoke what is called the two worlds doctrine, wherein it says there is the earthly world and there is the spiritual world. As far as the spiritual world is concerned, we are above you, which is the church is above the earthly establishment. And as far as the secular or the earthly world is concerned, the king will be treated as the primary source of power. But should he run into conflict with the church, guess who wins? The church. Okay, so the power of veto is written in the hands of the church. Now what the church then does is that it goes a step forward, applies this doctrine in the context of ownership of property to say that the state shall not have power over church's property. That is separation of the state from the church. And the way we understand it today is the exact opposite. We understand it today as the state not having a religious identity, whereas it was invoked in the context of protection of the church's property and its fiefdom from interference by the state. Okay? And when they did so, the conversation was still Christian in nature because the nature of the state and its identity remains Christian and the church is obviously Christian. So neither is denying each other's Christian identity. Then you cut to the Protestant Reformation and the war between the wannabe denominations of the Christian world and the only accepted denomination by the Catholic Church, which is Catholicism. You have the Lutheran movement and you have the Calvin movement, both of them simultaneously challenging the authority of the church. And one of the arguments that they raise is the church has become a den of corruption because it goes about issuing apologies and papal bulls for an ask. So it becomes a transactional exercise where anything can be purchased from the church. And therefore the, the ability of the church to pontificate to the rest, pun intended, uh, was, was was challenged, challenged. And, and that's how the reformation the movement starts now when the reformation movement starts you have to realize that you're looking at a christian europe and christian europe starts dividing itself between those states which are in support of the holy roman empire and therefore you have the the german houses naming namely the augsburg empire and so on and so forth in support of the the catholic church and then you have certain states moving towards the so-called Protestant Reformation movement. Multiple treaties are entered into between the parties stage-wise. In the first treaty, it's only Lutheran denomination that is accepted as the next acceptable denomination outside the Catholic denomination. Finally, a few, third, I think 30 years down the line, even Calvinian Reformation, sorry, uh, denomination is accepted as the next uh, denomination. So finally, you're looking at accommodation of non-Catholic denominations within the Christian worldview. Now, what happens then is that European princes also say the Catholic Church, whose head happens to be the Pope or the Vatican, shall not dictate terms to us in terms of our allegiance to a particular denomination. So then they come out with a formula saying, Within the territory of a particular princely state, it shall be the decision of that princely state and the ruler to adopt one form of denomination or another. That is Christian secularism, wherein the church, the Catholic church will not interfere with the adoption of a particular Christian denomination by a European Christian princely state. The conversation is entirely Christian in nature. Since when did it acquire this irreligious brand of secularism? Since when did secularism acquire this irreligious hue? It starts only post the French Revolution. Not until then. Okay? 
So secularism, as we understand it from, I mean, true to its origins, it basically says the state shall have a Christian identity. So that's the first consequence. The state shall have the freedom to decide which of the Christian denominations it shall subscribe to. That's the second consequence. Then comes the most important aspect, protection of minorities. But what minorities? Christian denominational minorities. Because in a Protestant state, Catholics are, are minorities and vice versa. Look at what the conversation is when you look at history and look at the sense in which we apply secularism today. Okay? So, I have said this before. Sure. If you want Bharat to be a secular state, I don't have a problem. But it shall then subscribe to the original brand of secularism. Which means it will be Hindu secularism. You can't have this... Uh, what we have in Bharat which passes off as secularism is a potluck dinner. It's a big breakfast. It's hot hotch. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's neither here nor there. It's a dog in the manger. It's a dobi ka kutta. Okay? Naghar ka naghar ka. So as far as I'm concerned, we have muddled up the concept. It's neither true to the European origins, nor is it true the, to, the, to our civilizational ethos. It is a utopian reimagination of what we think it is. And ye kahan se uthaya, kisi ko nahi so I am very clear that either I will go by the notion of Christian secularism because that is consistent with my primary goal which is Hindu, Hindu security or I will reject it altogether. A brand of secularism that forces me to sever my relationship with my past is not acceptable to me under any circumstances. Because I have no interest in drawing comparisons with the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> we are different. Like uh, there is this Maggie tomato sauce ad in the 90s. It's different. Right? <laughs> so we are different. I have no interest in comparing myself to the United States as if it's a benchmark to live by. Um, Otherwise, all talk of decolonization makes no sense whatsoever, right? So second, uh, the constitution as it exists, uh, exists is already uh, what I call a cannibalized version of the Irish constitution, Czechoslovakian constitution, and the US constitution. We were comfortable borrowing even from Czechoslovakia, <laughs> but not from our philosophies of politics. What? Um, I mean, this is mental slavery at its peak, Charam Seema. Okay. Article 14, oh yes, the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution. Or you go to the Constitution of Ireland, because it's Ireland. Interestingly, in Ireland, if there is a, a conflict between the interpretation of a particular provision in English and in Irish, guess which language they fall back on to understand their Constitution? And what do we do? Thank you. Uh, so, so I'm telling you that the hit reset button is most needed in the case of Bharat. But of course we'll be told, Achha, so which language would you want for Bharat? <laughs> My friends from the DMK will say, no, no, Tamil. <laughs> right? And then people from the north of Vindhyas might say, why, bhai, ye to rashtra bhasha hai. <laughs> to the, Again, the fight will start on Twitter. What is the difference between official language and national language? <laughs> I am saying, baat khatam karo, Sanskrit ko apna baat khatam. So, on this question, uh, you'd brought up temples, uh, the idea... At this pace, how do you hope to complete 230 questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of temples, the idea that the ch separation of church and state was that the state should not interfere in the churches, uh, but the church can actually influence the state. There's the Western concept of separation in church and state. So then, 
in India, should the government control the Hindu temples in India? And what role should Hindus play in protecting their religious sites? What's the Trish? answer? No! I just asked the question as it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say that since uh, Rome is the fount of all wisdom, okay, so I will say then the state shall not interfere with us. It is consistent with the separation of the temple and the state. Two, See, why did state control of temples start? Again, thoda history chale jate. A board of revenue was constituted in the British period, in the Madras presidency, I think under Thomas Munro. There were two problems that they wanted to address. You have to realize that post the Protestant Reformation, the Christian identity is significantly informed by the Protestant Reformation and its experience with the Catholic Church. So therefore, they start looking for the same set of villains which are comparable to the Catholic Church villains. So the priests are a problem everywhere. So Protestant Christianity has a specific animus and a special love for two religions which are priestly in nature. And that will explain anti-Semitism and anti-Hinduism. They have a problem with Judaism and Hinduism. Because Protestant Reformation has a problem with the existence of a priestly class. Okay? Because Protestant Reformation focused on democratization of religion and therefore it said the, the, that, that Christianity shall come out of the church and shall become available to everyone. So that is how equality as a concept started gaining traction in the context of religion. Fast forward 500 years down the line, Europe has no sense of identity. Because Protestant Reformation, which was feeding this churan of equality to everyone, came to a point where it destroyed its specialized institutions and the only brand of Christianity that has managed to keep itself alive is the Eastern Division of the Holy Roman Empire, which is the Byzantine Empire and therefore the Eastern Orthodox Church, Poland, Russia, so on and so forth. Because then they had to divide the Roman Empire into the Western and the Eastern. The Eastern became Byzantine, Constantinople, which we know as Istanbul today. So that's how this whole thing is. You're looking at a situation where Protestant Reformation did two things. It called for destruction of ritual. And it called for destruction of the priestly uh, class or the priestly position. The results are in front of you. Now you ask yourself if you can find echoes of the very same situation in Bharat. Because the literature shows that their hatred of the Catholic Church was foisted onto the Brahmin. And they said every institution that is populated by the Brahmin has two problems. One is an idol worshipping heathen. Therefore the basic assumption is that they don't have scruples and therefore corruption is the default mode. That's one. Second. Since there is a Brahmin and since there is a priestly class, expect both corruption and debauchery. So the Board of Revenue was constituted under the British government in the Madras Presidency to take over the temple. Now the good part is that the British man, at least at the outset, was equally fair or equally unfair. So he decided to take charge of both the temple as well as the mosque. This was until 1863. Now as usual, a vocal minority gets its way. And therefore, the only institution that remains under the control of the government is the temple. That policy has continued until 2024. So, if you want to talk about temple freedom, you have to address three specific issues in my humble opinion. One, the bogey of caste will have to be addressed. Because each time I speak of temple freedom, I am constantly told, Brahmin domination will be back. Untouchability apparently will be back. Is untouchability observed in the temples of United States? No. Are you all Brahmins? No. Ah. <laughs> so the point is, one, these are bogies which are as old as the colonial establishment itself. And therefore, every person who's repeating this nonsense is being true to the master that he serves. Whether he sits in Europe or America, it's for people to decide. Two, 
apart from the cast angle, the second angle is when someone tells me, oh, but the kings of yore also controlled temples. Sure, but they were Hindu kings. And this was a Hindu Rashtra. You can't have it both ways. You can't have the cake and eat it too. That I will take portions of a Hindu Rashtra when, it is, when it's convenient to me and I'll control your temples. But otherwise I will stand in the way of the creation of a Hindu Rashtra citing secularism as a, as an, as a bogey or an obstacle. How does that even work? What kind of diabolical mental cognizance, I mean, co I mean cognitive dissonance it takes for somebody to spew and spout this kind of nonsense? It says that the Vikruti is acute, acutely to be found only in the Hindu mind. <laughs> it has gone through so many layers of distortion that it needs multiple slaps and truth bombs. <laughs> so, <laughs> temple freedom, according to me, is not just about freeing this institution which is our sacred energy space, which according to me are the energy nodes of Bharat. It is also about unpacking the layers of nonsense in our heads about our own culture. And that is the very same stereotype that our children face in college campuses and school campuses. They are not different at all. It's all connected. It is all connected. Because all they have to do is to throw the caste bomb and your children become defenseless. They don't know what to say. Baat khatam. I am trying to use this temple freedom movement not as an activist, it's a word that I, I certainly wish to distance myself from. I am a practicing advocate who is a practicing Hindu who is trying to combine both parts of my identity. Which is that you have to use this as a moment to revisit what you think you know about your community and your history. And this is a, le a learning teaching moment for us. I just, it, it so happens that in the Stanford event today, I'm, I brought up my much maligned article of, of a few weeks ago called Caste is a Western Construct. So I was telling people that that wasn't the original title. The original title was Caste is a Western Construct, so what? Assume for a moment that you still accept that, how does that change the ground reality was the direction in which I wanted to push the conversation. Now Indian Express being Indian Express, edited the title and simply put it out as cast as a western construct, did not even play it back for my review and confirmation before they published the article. And lo and behold, Bernal sales went up. <laughs> People are like, what is he saying? That cast is invented by the British. Are, 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 kya ho gaya? What is he saying? Ye to puri se pagal ho gaya hai. I said, are bhai, main vakil hu. so my basic funda is, don't go by the title, go by the content of the document. <laughs> Whether it's a license or a transfer or an assignment or a hypothecation or a pledge or whatever it is, don't go by what the document claims to, to say it is, you read the document itself. And so I said, okay, do you understand where does the word caste come from? Okay, okay, you just say it comes from Portuguese caste. But when it ends, no. You look at Spanish history and you look at Portuguese history. Caste actually has a race component. No wonder when caste is sought to be equated with racism in this country, that is the history that they hearken back to. Whereas Jati and Varna don't have a race component. So if I speak of dharma and I say, dharma is not the same as religion, I'll find a lot of people nodding their heads, ha ha, correct, correct, correct. I'm applying the very same logic, then caste is not the same as Varna and Jati. Semantics makes a difference, language makes a difference because every word has its associated history that it has generated meaning for hundreds of years. So while you want to speak of temple freedom, I would suggest that you also use it as an opportunity to talk about caste. Not caste, Jati and Varna. Because while each of you has put together this brilliant video because you know that this, uh, these resolutions are coming back to affect you and they will affect you in a very real way, there are people sitting in Bharat who call themselves Hindutvadis, who have taken a very clear position that temple freedom is an unachievable goal as long as caste discrimination in temples is not abolished. So while you are trying to shore up the, the image of Bharat here and the Hindu community here, Aag Vahim Pilagri and the mothership. Okay? So the place where this video is most important is not just USA. It has to be shown in Bharat is what I'm trying to tell you. 
because your own home team will kick a self goal while you're trying to defend and, and establish your case here. So please make sure that this conversation is taken up on a wider level. There is more depth lent to this conversation and the subject. And that means you take an active interest in humanities and not just the STEM side of <laughs> livelihood. I am in, a, I'm in some position to say this. As a former engineer who has made the transition to law, I am in some position to make this statement. Right? If you don't do it and if you don't make the transition, I suspect that you are fighting a losing battle. In the foreseeable future, it's not a legacy problem that you will bequeath to your children. You will see it happen right in your lifetime. So, most uh, people of the diaspora decided to set up, uh, let's say, their livelihoods and careers and lives here because they didn't want to deal with the problems of reservation and whatnot in India or Bharat. Plus, there was lack of opportunity and whatnot. You will see <laughs> affirmative action being introduced in the private sector through the DEI route. <laughs> Something that is unachievable in Bharat will happen here. And what will you do? Because what you, what you want to call a stereotype is accepted as a reality at home. So where will you go and sell your case? These guys won't accept it. Those guys won't accept it. You're stuck. You're the... You're by definition a Trishanku. <laughs> Next. So to build on that, uh, what you're saying, that you know, caste has a linguistic uh, component to it, and, and we know here in the United States, especially in California, there's been, I mean, you have the SB 403, which I know they're going to try again. It's already been started in a lot of other states. The fight is very vicious here in the United States on this caste angle, and especially because race is such a sensitive issue in this country, and they're equating the two. So it's an easy fight for them. It's a very difficult fight for us. But in the meantime, and this is the second part of this question, our kids are actually hearing this whole discussion, uh, and they're you know, getting turned off from our own culture. Uh, what is the strategy? What, what is the right way to, to tackle not only the institutional fight, but also with, uh, in our own homes? I'll draw from the brilliant opening remarks of Vita Simhaji. He said that one of the biggest apprehensions that you have is whether the next generation will feel the same proximity to the mothership. Why do Hindus alone have this worry? Why not others? Why do Hindus alone apprehend loss of Hindu consciousness in their children? Or why is it the most in our community and why not others? According to me, there's a clear reason for it. Is that a sign? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the answer is very clear. You don't have your institutional support here. And when I, what I mean by institutional support is either you subscribe to a joint family system which also makes sure that you have some kind of a cultural value imparted through that system, which is improbable and impossible or perhaps infeasible in today's day and age. So the only other institutional support system that you're capable of actually giving to yourself as a community is the temple. How many schools have been established which are associated with Hindu temples by the Hindu community in, Uni in the United States? Zero. That's your answer. Okay. How many schools have been established by other Asian communities here? A lot. If you have a problem going to a private Catholic school, you at least have a Chinese option because you think that's safer. Why don't we have schools here? What am I saying that's rocket science? And what am I saying that's not obvious? What am I saying that the brilliant minds of the Hindu diaspora in the United States couldn't have thought of? And what am I saying that's beyond the pale of possibility and within your means? It's time for us to start thinking of those institutions which cater to our specific needs. The more you hope 
that the state apparatus here will be available to help you each time. You will make the very same mistake of outsourcing all your problems to the state apparatus with no iota of self-reliance. Certainly build fantastic relationships and networks with the state apparatus because that's crucial. And you, if you don't, somebody else is going to occupy the space. I get that. I completely get that. But where are your own institutional support systems and mechanisms that ensure that there is a cushion for people to fall back on so that when there is a blow that lands on you from the rest of the society, there is something to soften that blow. Every family and every parent is fighting a lonely battle here. And if I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me. It's a lonely battle simply because you're fighting as disparate units and discrete units, not double E-T, E-T-E. So I suggest that if you don't use this as a moment of awakening and start thinking of long-term institutional mechanisms, educational, cultural, religious, and whatnot, where every religious occasion is used as a teachable moment and not just as a celebratory moment, if you don't start doing that, our festivals, our traditions will be made fun of. Kanyadan has already become unacceptable in several parts of the diaspora society when they choose to marry someone else. I know of instances where if it happens to be an interracial marriage or an interfaith marriage, the girl coming from, I'm assuming it's still okay to call a girl a girl, so... <laughs> You don't know. A woman person, I'll be safe. <laughs> has specifically rejected the possibility of going through Kanyadan even if she marries a Hindu boy. Because that's... Imagine somebody from the other community being aware of a negative stereotype relating to Kanyadan. That's the extent of the vicious propaganda. So then other words had to be found as replacement and pariyavachi shabd for kanyadan. So you're fighting this with, bo with both your hands tied to your back. And you never, this is a civilizational boxing match. You don't enter a boxing ring with your hands tied to your back. Keep all your options open. At least start doing this. Then we'll come to the next issue of street veto. That's the second issue altogether. It's a different issue altogether at least have these basics in place. Have a timeline. All the Hindu organizations that are divided on religion, uh, sorry, on, on lang linguistic lines here, will have to start talking to each other. They have to start talking to each other. <laughs> Feel free to celebrate Onam separately, Sankranti separately, do all of that. I don't have a problem with it. After all, Bharat is a thali of multiple options. So fantastic, go ahead and do it. But let us have a common minimum program, a CMP of sorts, where you're in a position to understand how do we defend our common interests. That's not going to put an end to the bickering within us. Indians are not going to fight, But at least have a very clear red line where you will not cross that red line, a non-negotiable of sorts for the entire community. And I hope platforms such as these and engagements such as these become less about celebrating one individual and more about providing a direction to the community which it direly needs. So I'm going to ask one more question. In the meantime, we are going to go to the audience. So uh, if we can set up the mics so that uh, questions can come from the audience. Um, so while that's getting set up, my last question from this list would be, you know, the idea that you talked about that in order to really protect our, our community and our civilization here in the United States, we need to start building institutional support. Uh, I'll give you an example. Just recently, the city of Fremont became the first school district in all of California to offer Hindi. And that's with the schools having 70 to 75% Indians. Uh, now, while this process is going on, our biggest enemy were our own people who said that, why are you trying to make this noise? Just let it be. You know, we're Americans. We can adjust. What would be your answer to that? See, 
there is always going to be a cross section of the diaspora crowd which has assimilated fully, which believes that it is part of the American culture. And I'm not going to sit in judgment on it. If that's how they want to go about it, so be it. Um, and if it works out well for them, good. But my sense is it won't. It's not my wish. It's not something I want. But the realities are that you may choose to run away from your identity, but others will constantly see that identity in you. So, I've given this example in the past. I think there is this party in Israel called the Yeshatid. The founder of the party, rather his father, I think was a cultural Jew who had no interest in his faith. Now, when he started working as a community organizer, the question was, if you're a cultural Jew, why are you working for the Jewish interest? He said, I did not want my identity to be, or rather my religion or my faith to be the, the, the foremost aspect of my identity. But Hitler kept seeing a Jew in me all the time. And therefore, I had no other option but to band and group with my people. As simple as that. So I hope that the ones who have assimilated, all goes well for them. If it doesn't, whether they like it or not, I still see them as members of my community. Unfortunately, that's how I am made. And therefore, the hope is that when trouble knocks at their doors, the rest of the community has the support system and the mechanism to protect them. Because this utopia that they live in, the world is a global village and all that nonsense, uh, that will come crashing down at some point. And when it does, we must be ready to hold them. That's our job, period. And here I'd like to make one unsolicited suggestion to the members of the audience. None of this is going to happen without material support. It's not going to happen without material support. Whether you like it or not, dharma needs artha, period. So find a way to support community related uh, causes and initiatives as much as possible. Uh, by the grace of the Devatas, Lakshmi has blessed you abundantly. So do two things, concrete suggestions here. One, those who are interested in pursuing a career in humanities from the perspective of protecting our way of life by entering that battleground called humanities, support them please. <laughs> Second, these kind of initiatives will need your active support and vocal support. Three. Should I make this point or not? <laughs> Pool in your resources, form trusts, and purchase land surrounding temples in Bharat. Because if you don't, those lands are being literally and figuratively cannibalized. And uh, our kshetras and your punya kshetras are being surrounded by people who certainly don't wish well for dharma. The cleanest possible way, the most non-confrontational way of addressing this problem is to buy the place, period. Do it. At least buy land that is surrounding your Kuladevata temples. At least start with that. then we can at least avoid one potential problem, which is that of encroachment. These are certain tangibles. It doesn't need an IQ of 120 plus or 160 to come up with these solutions. But these solutions don't occur when there is a lack of will or intent. And precisely because of that, I'm having to make these suggestions. So I think there are enough doables and deliverables which are entirely within the control and remit of the community here. Beyond this, I don't think anybody should have excuses. <laughs> if they do, there's a clear lack of intent. If that's the case, destiny will address it one way or the other. <laughs> Next.
Uh, so we are uh, going to move to questions from the audience. I do, you know, just to kind of go back to uh, Saiti Bikji's point that, you know, we need to start creating support structures for ourselves. I do want to push the, the Indic dialogue. I don't know if the QR code, I can't see the screens from here. Um, but at least to volunteer, join the WhatsApp groups or channels uh, or donate. Um, if, uh, if you have questions, you can find some of the volunteers and talk to them. The moderator was very diffident in asking for contributions or donations. Don't be. This is a community's cause. If people don't, the choice is theirs. They made the decision. They have not asked me to say this, but I am saying this bluntly. There is no enforced zakat here. And since you have already given proof of your interest by attending this session, I think we are well within our rights to basically say, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with, okay. If you could please, uh, to, just a couple of uh, um, things I would like to mention. Please introduce yourself, just quickly your name. Um, please keep it concise because uh, we have uh, a limited amount of time. Just ask your question if you can. Um, thank you, go ahead. And don't be repetitive. Can you hear me? I, we cannot hear you. Oh no. Um, Namaskaram, sorry. I, I, I'll come I, back to you. I'll come back to you. Yeah. 100%. Uh, Namaskaram, sorry. Thank you Namaste. very much for everything that you do. Uh, I run a startup, a uh, non-profit for temples in Bharat, uh, and laying a platform that allows people to be able to participate in any which way they want. In your opinion, what is the best way for people to be able to So, one of the things that over the last six or seven years what has happened is, uh, apart from supporting uh, dharmic initiatives with my legal services on a pro bono basis to the extent I can and balancing it with my commercial commitments, we realize that the legal process is bound to yield outcomes at a very slow process. And that's the pace of the Indian legal system and I'm not going to sit and blame the legal system beyond a point in a foreign jurisdiction. But the other thing that we decided to do was to support temple restoration causes on the ground. And that way the idea was to bust quite a few caste east myths through collaborative efforts on the ground. So, uh, in my personal capacity, I've contributed and several others have. And there are so many temples in hostile spaces that a bunch of volunteers have reclaimed and restored. That it tells me that all is not lost. There is still a lot of hope. We have to find, I think, our own ways of supporting this movement one way or the other. Either you use the temple as a place where you can teach those without resources. If that's a way you can do, please do. I also have given the suggestion that perhaps since the state apparatus and the bureaucratic apparatus is being taken over by hostile elements in a systematic fashion, the temple must at least start supporting those candidates who are interested in entering public service one way or the other. See, the point is we may be interested in creating wealth and in the process we have given up completely on the state apparatus. And that apparatus is being taken over gradually, systematically. If you read my second book, and I'm not selling the second book here, if you read the second book, this is the exact strategy that was adopted by Syed Ahmad Khan, the founding father of the Pakistan movement, according to me, and the founder of the two-nation theory in the 19th century as a way of taking over the English establishment while retaining the English in power. Because the Congress had a lot of people who had already uh, occupied certain positions under the British establishment, he realized that this is the way forward. And that's exactly why the, the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College was set up, which you know today as the Aligarh Muslim University. So I think we need to start looking at our temples as spaces where apart from preserving the sanctity of the energy space which has been consecrated there, you also look at 
supporting the community in different ways. Temples have previously been guilds. They've operated as, as banks and whatnot. That money and that resource and the amount of resources that our temples have, even today, despite all the loss and, uh, uh, let's say, unconsented alienation, is tremendous. If you're able to convert that into an actionable resource, there is, a, there is a lot that we can still do. Allow me to say this, and this is based on my assessment of the situation on the ground. The demographic strength of Hinduism is kept alive by the rural population still. Because the fertility rates are still decent, they are not scared of having children, okay? And they know for, a f for whatever reason, it could also be for reasons of livelihood, that more the hands, the more are the people who can earn, so on and so forth, whatever it may be, they are still keeping that demographic strength alive and that's one of the reasons we are still in the 70s. We are, I think according to me, we are totering on this in the 70s, we are no more in the 80s. That is, assuming that the entire 70% population is a practicing Hindu population and they are not full of Hinos. Okay, Hindus in name only. So, we have to find a way to use the temple to continue incentivizing these people to do two things. They must not vacate villages and districts and come to the city because then that entire space is lost. That's how Exodus starts. And you have to find ways of giving them opportunity in that place. Is there a way that we can put our minds and heads and collective IQs together to make this happen, to ensure two things, that people don't flee those spaces, that they have opportunities in those places, and they also use the temple as the epicenter or the node for these activities. How do we do that? That's the problem statement. Let's see what solutions come about. You should have a business competition on these lines. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we can take a question from this side. You introduce uh, yourself and then please ask. Yes, then after that we go back to the photo. Yes, yes. Hello, sir. My name is Vipan. I'm on TV. That looks like a crowd from a Zakir Naik lecture. Thank you to stand like this. <laughs> yes, go on. Okay. Uh, sir, first of all, thank you for articulating what all of us have known tried for decades but we are quite able to say. Um, thank you for this amazing yeah. thing that people are doing. My question to you is, in recent Western cultural discourse, uh, there is a new term that is being thrown around called South Asian. Mm -hmm. And it aims to put everyone from the Indian subcontinent, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Correct. into one bucket. Correct. And I would like to ask you, uh, how should we counter, well, I had an argument with my friends about, hey, I don't think that's a, you know, fair term to uh, you know, introduce and right. that, why what's the problem? Aren't we all the same? We look the same, we eat the same food. And I would like your thoughts on uh, is South Asian a valid term that we should accept? Because it is I say this with no iota of humility. I don't have the answers to all questions. <laughs> but I see the problem here is this. It goes back to the root issue. One is, this has been a systematic attempt, at least since the 19th century, to rob the Indian subcontinent of its existence and its identity fully. So the Indian subcontinent, the Indian Ocean, so that's why the whole term has been replaced. So that's the power of language. And that's something that the West, and in particular, the Protestant Reformation has understood really well, the power of words. So whoever enjoys mastery and authority over language and words and definitions, ultimately has power over thought control. Two, doesn't it tell you all the more that you're seeding or you have, you're paying the price of having seeded the humanity space? It, it boils down to that. See, I can understand that in the 90s, families which were uh, straddling the thin red line between the low middle class and the middle class in Bharat needed to pursue those careers which ensured quick return on investment. Okay, I understand that. I come from a similar background, therefore I completely understand the urge to take up engineering or medicine. That is no more a pretext or an excuse available to people who have lived here for three generations. Surely that's not an excuse available anymore. And two, I've heard this from students and children from the Indian diaspora, the Hindu diaspora in particular, in my interactions with them online. There was this uh, webinar that was organized during the COVID, I think in 2021 
the number of messages, heartfelt messages I received from them when I said, please support those who, who wish to pursue a career in humanities. Children pointing out the trouble that they have in selling that as a career option to their parents. Okay? For a community that, sub, that takes such pride in culture, it doesn't want to invest in knowledge production of culture. There has to be some balance that you strike. And to, then what exactly is the commitment for dharma? Who are you hoping to outsource this battle to? Part-timers. That won't work beyond a point. There's, an, there's a Raktabija army on the other side. <laughs> Where you try and bring down a portal, you get another portal. You try and bring down an organization, there's another organization. You think you've cut off the head, five come in, 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 in places like Hydra, right? What do you think you're exactly fighting against? You're not fighting, you're not fighting people, you're fighting an idea. And the response to that has to be with an idea. So we try and personalize our fights. Some lady sitting in Rutgers, some other person sitting somewhere else. But these are the kind of conversations that we have. And we have this insta gratification moments where somebody decides to ask a question of her in public and that becomes a real moment without realizing that she has just shot down that person with a response on the strength of her authority on the subject and not on the strength of her scholarship. Authority and scholarship being two different things altogether. Now, you may have the urge, the emotion or the angst to respond. But what is it that matters in these conversations? Credentials, credibility, pedigree, qualification. You may not like it, you can hate them for it. But the left has managed to produce in America single agenda of fanatics where people invest in a particular area for 25 years, 30 years. That's the extent of their commitment. In a civilizational battle, it is always a battle of conviction and commitment, not technology. Not technology. Our blind faith in technology is, is it's, it's almost as if since we have lost the stomach to fight this battle, we have chosen to outsource this battle to technology in the hope that somehow technology will address this. Technology is at best an aid, but is always an aid in the aid of a mindset and in the aid of a particular thought, in the aid of a particular conviction. That needs to reflect in the decisions that we take at the individual level as well as at the societal level. The next wave, which I think is going to be a deadly wave in multiple ways, is the AI wave. Again, we will make the mistake of looking at AI only through the prism of loss of jobs and employment. We will not look at the issue of what it is going to do to our consciousness, to our ability to think, to our ability to make sense of reality, to distort reality. These are questions that we need to start answering. So, what I'm perhaps trying to tell you is that there is no quick fix for the South Asian problem because that is an investment of centuries, at the very least of decades. And you're hoping to address that through Insta Reels and Shots or YouTube Reels and Shots. It won't work. So, I, re I think people like me can at best do so much because we also have our regular jobs to do and we are hoping to transpose our skills to these areas. I genuinely wish that I came from a background which had the ability to make a choice which is fully uh, humanities based. I wish I, I came from that background but I did not. So I had to work my way up. Those who are in a position to take those decisions must be allowed to do that. Do you think it's, it's sheer coincidence that most people operating in the Indian left come from affluent backgrounds who have chosen to actually dedicate their lives to the pursuit of these careers? No, it's not. According to me, that's been the traditional Indian way where most traditional Hindu families, after a certain point of time, once they have acquired material resources, would start looking at contributing to the society in the next generation. The fact is, non-Hindutvavadis have decided to invest more in the society but in a negative way. But Hindutvavadis have chosen to invest in Lakshmi more with very little interest in contributing to culture. That paradox, you can blame them only so much for it. 
the irony of it is according to me it's dark it's for us to realize that the only humanity that you're capable of touching even with a 10 feet barge pole is law because return on investment even there somewhere you have to realize that hard work pays whether you like it or not and those who are willing to invest and those who are willing to commit themselves notwithstanding the the dusht nature of their sankalpam will still succeed because they have decided to pursue that particular line of thought after all it takes decades and years and generations for vishnu to take avataram no because until then devas are drinking whereas the asur has been doing tapas all the while and he's decided to get the boon and he's decided to latch on to that the tapas with a, a, a venom and a vengeance that only he is capable of so when everything's lost then we say oh vishnu oh brahma oh shiva that's exactly what is happening don't wait for things to come to such a pass you have the ability to invest in these in these arenas do it please do it thank you sir so you take the next question no he has been waiting for a while karan and arjun ha ah. you know the cd and the cdi they seem to be election time strategy for uh, bjp that putting the actual culprits behind use the mic because i think there's a live audience also that's trying you can you can use one of the mics please use the mic please go ahead so uh, karan and arjun uh, ed and the cbi seem to be election time strategy mm. if the actual culprits you know robert wadra arvin kejriwal all these guys being pursued by uh, cbi and ed during election times mm. if they are actually put behind bars mm. probably 90% of our problems can be solved the farmer strikes you know the conversion gallo all that why is that not being done i'll give you a slightly unconventional answer to this <laughs> the problem with the hindu community is its lack of drishti and focus i genuinely don't care for ed cbi wadra nothing i'll tell you why Now let me exactly answer the question why I've seen the world enough to know that lobbies and special interest groups and corruption exists everywhere okay it's a matter of degree and it's a question of whether it exists in sensitive areas which affect national security beyond that it's a reality everywhere one of the reasons that i genuinely don't care for the daily hustle and bustle of politics or the appetite of politics is that it is the most superficial top soil where the analysis is always myopic and the conversation boils down to the very same nonsensical congress versus bjp diet drive that conversation takes us nowhere as a community the questions that i would ask and the anvils on the basis of which that i will decide my voting options or decisions are always this as follows one is my community better off are my institutions independent is the state apparatus skewed in favor of any particular faith system which has pitted itself against the faith system of my civilization four has the dispensation compromised on national security both from within and outside five has it done something decent to improve the quality of life and the standard of life because the problem with the secularization of the political argument is that we focus heavily on corruption whereas the other side focuses heavily on community interest 
which means the other side is willing to invest even in a corrupt option as long as it delivers the community interest. Whereas what we do is that we are looking at it from pure metrics of infrastructure, electricity, gas and whatnot. And in the process, the larger question that we, we should be asking is, assume for a moment that we achieve first, level, first world levels of prosperity, but we have endangered our demographic security, is that a reality that we are willing to live in? Is a question that I find is very rarely asked. You have the example of Pakistani Hindus right in front of you and still you don't want to ask the question. You have the example of Kashmiri Pandits, you still don't want to ask the question. You have the example of Bengali Hindus both within West Bengal as well as in Bangladesh, you still don't want to ask that question. How many more examples do we need as a community which are live case studies happening right in, our, right in front of our eyes for us to start realizing that these are the primary questions to be asked? Do you really think that the so-called minorities of Bharat give a damn about corruption? No, they don't. The interest is in advancement of community interest, period. As simple as that. The difference has always been only in the degree of commission, period. And most importantly, what makes a difference is that someone suddenly shows up on the radar who challenges established notions. But that's always a matter of chance, that's always a matter of probability. That is once in a generation. What happens the rest of the time? Are you going to leave community's interest entirely to a matter of probability and chance? Please reset your priorities. I am not asking you to not focus on infrastructure and economics. Of course, yes. But culture and economics must go hand in hand, period. And if you're forced to choose between the two, I know who will choose what. The other side will choose its way of life and we will choose economics. As long as that remains the reality, you are fighting a losing battle in what is called an infinite war. Period. So before we go to the next question, I, uh, I'll, I'd like to request Vijayji to make a quick announcement. And actually, uh, the lines, if you want to ask questions, there are uh, two mics set up here. I just want to let everyone know that. So while the speakers were talking about material support, we had a WhatsApp link there. So that doesn't gel well. Now we have a donation link there. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you raise your phones and see if that at least shows up in your phone, that Zell account, and see for five seconds. It's working? No, no, I want everyone to try. <laughs> so can you give a five seconds pause and uh, they can have some water? And then we will continue. Thank you very much. So uh, we're, uh, you know, actually before we go back to the questions, you know, just as a follow up to what you just said, there's a famous thing that says, uh, there's this, you said community culture versus economics, but in this country they say that, is it politics that influences culture or culture that influences politics? I think politics is the downstream of culture. And what I'm trying to say perhaps is that the basic DNA of a country's politics is informed by its culture. Let's do a compare and contrast exercise between let's say Bharat and US on the one hand. The United States for the better part of its existence has defined its goals on the animals of pursuit of happiness which when you break it down further has typically translated to opportunity, freedom and material prosperity. Okay? Strictly speaking, it hasn't had 
it hasn't had a a strong cultural glue perhaps which it did when it it came together to form a nation it had a very clear christian identity a very clear protestant bent of mind with time what has happened is that opportunity freedom economics has prevailed over its protestant identity and today what it it has become according to me is a huge corporation masquerading as a country okay in the process it is going through a serious loss of identity an identity crisis at the micro level as well as at the macro level you want another example a better example happens to be europe because europe has a greater cultural and religious mooring than america it has a, a a much more organic let's say history to it it is not the product of a synthetic fight with respect to representation it has a very clear cultural uh, uh, let's say mooring it has a very clear linguistic mooring and a very clear religious mooring as well of course post the fall of the roman empire and take over of the christians fully the last christian state according to me is lithuania which was i think which was converted in the 15th century or what i think so so europe reaches material prosperity and simultaneously starts giving up on all its core core christian values whatever was left was completely vacated because the french revolution chose to inform the rest of europe as well gradually and today it has absolutely no clue or the first clue to deal with the challenge of the middle east it has no response mechanism because it has done two things since it has become irreligious and because it has lost faith in the christian establishment you have only two possibilities either you're an atheist or you have succumbed to the fastest rising religion in in europe that happens two you have given up on the family structure fully the direct consequence of that is that you don't have a demographic replacement strategy in place that's gone you don't have a demographic replacement strategy you don't have identity you have created a first world apparatus which is ripe for fantastic takeover job done and your institutions are basically saying we are open we are free we are open we are free we are open we are free we have no identity of our own except for freedom and equality you have told yourself this and those very values are being subverted against you which means every position and every uh, public position is available for available for anybody's occupation and since demographics and democracy go hand in hand it's a numbers game whoever has the maximum numbers will occupy those positions it starts with the king maker position to the king position realize the 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 importance is once you see these live examples and then you see the stark contrast in eastern europe with time the unfortunate reality will be that eastern europe will be looked up to constantly for people's ability to protect themselves and you'll be left with those options which are not particularly democratic in nature so you'll be forced to choose between survival and democracy what do you do then what will you do then there is a reason why the nature of democracy itself is going through a churn even in the west because it has not exactly produced the strongest of options or a strong hand so to speak which can steer the ship and so people are looking up to all sorts of examples desperate people look for strong examples wherever they can get so i do believe that our ancestors cracked the code in a beautiful way which went through a phase of deritualization during a certain period and that is why we paid the price for it but otherwise they made sure that the kshatra identity remains the brahman identity remains the vaishya identity remains and the shudra identity remains so that every aspect is addressed and there are dedicated resources for it now do those divisions make sense in an industrialized world that's a very good question to ask then how do you reapply the template in ways in which it addresses contemporary situations what do you do then i'll give you a good example you don't have teachers in in bharat who are willing to actually teach out of passion for the subject 
they exist, but it's not exactly uh, something that people gravitate towards out of choice. Okay, that's the same thing when it comes to attracting people into the armed forces. Because honor codes and duty codes have been replaced with incentive systems. Which means the concept of duty has been completely replaced with the concept of a right. And the fight for more rights in the name of individualism is always a race to the bottom as far as the community is concerned because nobody is interested in stepping up to fulfill the other aspect of the right coin which is the duty coin. So our institutions will keep creating rights. The judiciary will create rights, people will create rights, NGOs will create rights. But where is the duty aspect of it? Where is the duty aspect of it? Who's going to take interest in this? So there is a reason why in Western systems and systems which have imitated the West, there is a deep mistrust of the state. Because we see the state as an opportunistic entity. We constantly see the need for a judiciary to prevent the state from encroaching our liberties. I had a very good example being cited to me from Japan recently. Even in the worst of earthquakes, the Japanese trust their state authorities to help them out and they stay in the building which is quaking. And their confidence is typically validated and vindicated by the state authority. That is the stark cultural difference. Because apart from having subscribed to certain western notions of development, the one thing that Japan has managed to crack is retained its honor codes in quite a few of its professions. Retained its obligation codes. Re retained importance of honesty, efficiency, punctuality and whatnot, Which is ingrained in their culture and which they will never contribute under any circumstances in the name of diversity. Okay? Those are the kind of systems. You can call them closed systems, you can keep celebrating the open systems. The consequence of open systems are right in front of you. <laughs> closed systems will survive in the long run, period. So if uh, the person on this side would like to introduce themselves and ask their question. Jai Shri Krishna, my name is Shreya Maheshwari. First of all, I would like to thank you so much um, because you are such an inspiration. Uh, like truly, I have become more inclined in my culture and religion after listening to you. Uh, so my question is... Thank you, very sweet of you, Jai Shri Krishna. So my question is, what can I, the youth Hindu do outside of India, do to apply the principles of decoloniality and preserving Hinduism directly? So the use of decoloniality has become very controversial. Uh, ever since I wrote the book, I know for a fact that subsequent events have led to more controversy about what exactly is decoloniality? How far back in time do you want to decolonize? Does this mean that it comes at the exclusion of certain other identities, so on and so forth? My fundamental argument has been that every culture has the right to define decolonization for itself. No academic sitting in Harvard will decide for us. Okay? No academic sitting in the West will decide what Bharat must do for itself, particularly when it comes to decolonization, that we will decide, period. <laughs> Two, what can you do? Uh, maybe these are trivial doables, but nevertheless I'll share. Um, visible symbols of Hindu identity wherever possible. <laughs> I've said this before, I'm not saying anything new. Apart from the fact that they have certain metaphysical, let's say, connotations as far as we are concerned, the Agnya Chakra and whatnot, that's a different issue. But it is important for you to announce your presence. Otherwise, your presence will be pixelated and wiped out and airbrushed fully. <laughs> that you exist and you exist with pride is important. You know, despite all my so-called bombastic talk on decoloniality, I was struggling in the morning. Should I wear my vibhuti and kumkum and what? I was just wondering. I said, I don't care. If it starts a controversy, it, it, so be it. I don't, give, I don't care at all. So I said, I'll, I'll wear it and go. And the best part is, there were people wearing the Veshti and the Dhoti in Stanford. It was brilliant. So, what can we do at individual levels? Our conduct perhaps is going to be used for us or against us is something that we must perhaps realize. And two, our individual competence is also proof of what we can do as a community and especially in a diaspora, I think the strongest thing that you bring to the table is your competence. That's been the strength of this community from the beginning. 
you are seen as a law abiding ideal minority i am not asking you to change those notions i am only saying also become a vocal minority you don't need to be a ruckus creating minority that is constantly hugging this cactus of victimhood you don't need to do that others are there to do it let them do it <laughs> that's their job positive examples that you set and create my hunch is could get you allies from those who are trying to address a common problem i leave please try and read between the lines so when you are in in america obviously i have never lived here i have just come here as a tourist often so i have no idea what the realities are on the ground on a daily basis i'm just trying to extrapolate whatever i have understood of history to see if it applies to circumstances here it may help to start building partnerships even at the societal level with those communities whom you have sheltered in the past and you continue to do so in bharat and who have found a safe haven in bharat for thousands of years without ever having faced a holocaust right and you don't need to look for uh, equivalence in theology that's not needed don't go down that path that's very naive and uh, according to me embarrassing okay there are there are very clear theological differences but there are clear interests and commonality of interests and overlaps it's important to start building those uh, those bridges and relationships when you do that gradually i think sense will prevail and if not if not at least i don't think this community will find itself alone when the chips are down but in any case what is the number of or what is the population what is the strength of hindus in this country 4 million that's not bad at all that's not bad at all the one thing that you can do without any support from anyone any support from anyone have more children <laughs> have more children <laughs> no state interference whatsoever because demographics is destiny okay demographics is destiny and there is some safety in numbers and the good part is this country has the ability to accommodate more people <laughs> so when it is doing so from the south of the border they might as well do it from within <laughs> right so these are things that i think maybe you should ponder over so that's all i have to offer next uh i you know i know there's lots of questions uh and there's lots of people online i i really apologize because we had like i said even online there were lots of people love you uh <laughs> so um i think we have quite time for one or two more questions before we have to close the event um vijay ji and uh, for your in interest sri jay sai deepak has uh, allocated some time after the event for a photo op <laughs> so so there so that needs to be balanced please give rakhi ji how she can control the question answer session but also he also needs to go somewhere and have some food right so so another 15 minutes we'll close the questions yeah, yeah? so maybe one more question take two i don't have a problem take two Okay, so let's do uh, just a few more questions. We can take a question from this side. Yeah. Thank you, Jay Sai Deepak. Uh, my name is Subramanian. I'm deaf in one ear. Thoda uncha boli. Okay. Uh, I have one request from you, like uh, for humanity's perception. Yes. I want you to promote how everyone can learn and get into that pursuit. That's one thing. Uh, on your Insta reels or YouTube. That's one. Uh, and second one, I want to file. PIL within Supreme Court that Gandhi is not Mahatma. <laughs> and and uh, and another one, another question. Uh, this question is when leftists were able to get everything done within like couple of hours, like one to two hours, they can move the Supreme Court even during the midnight. as a constitutional attorney under freedom of speech why can't you get the string reveals back into the public okay see i think uh, it, this question 
warrants a few clarifications about what I do, and then this is <laughs> this is not a self edificatory exercise, but I think this clarification is is important to set the record straight. Sure. So one, it is beneath my professional dignity and my professional ego to behave like an ambulance chaser. Because already there are certain negative stereotypes about our profession. <laughs> and I don't want to reinforce them. Two, you have to realize the, the precarious position I typically find myself in. And m most people may not understand this. If I take up more cases that relate to the community, I'll be accused of being jobless. That's one. Iske paas iske alawar koi kami nahi hai. Okay. Second thing is, if I do well, they'll say I feathered my nest at the expense of the community. If I, if, assume for a moment that in a particular matter the outcome is negative. This guy took it up because of his publicity and because of his publicity mongering and he, he screwed it up completely. In either case, it, re it really doesn't cover me in good light. So, I have been hyper-selective about these things. One, I will never, ever, ever be a full-time public interest litigator. It does injustice to my skills as a commercial litigator who is good at what he does. I will never do it. Okay? I am someone who is in love with his profession and I know what I am good at and what I am not. So, commercial litigation has given me the financial independence and thought independence to say what I say without being beholden to anybody. Okay? No party affiliations, no organizational affiliations under any circumstances. Because that gives me the ability to take a position which is in community's interest as opposed to organizational interest. That is a position that I'd like to retain. Two. When you take up everything, after a point it becomes about you and not the cause. That needs to be avoided. And the idea has always been to widen the base of stakeholders when it comes to this battle. And that decision has paid off because multiple lawyers have turned up in so many uh, high courts and, and even in the Supreme Court to take up our causes. Three. I practice in the nature of an arguing counsel. It crudely translates to the mold of a barrister in UK. Which means my clients are lawyers themselves. Who engage me to argue on their behalf. I don't draft, I don't file. I did that for the first seven years of practice. After that I moved up the value chain. I'm very clear about what I will not do. And the one non-negotiable is that I will not sacrifice on my professional standing for any cause. Because that's what gives me the ability to stand and shout properly. That's, that's something I will never compromise on, no matter what the consequences. So, assume for a moment somebody is in trouble. I would want to help them, but I will not until they come and ask. Because there's a professional protocol to be observed. They know of my existence, I can say this confidently today. If you are from this side and you're not aware of my existence, then you're living under a rock, period. I can say this uh, without uh, having to actually feign modesty here. And if you choose not to come to me for any kind of support, then you've taken a professional call, I respect it, whatever it may be. But I will not say, shall I represent you? No, that's beneath my dignity, I won't do it. I will not do it. Three, there are certain causes which require a different character and quality of representation. I know what I'm cut out for and I'm very clear the depth to which I can go to for certain causes. So I am hyper-selective about these things. Most people assume that I have taken up what, 20, 30 cases of uh, dharmic character. I have taken less than 15 cases. But each of those 15 cases have been high stakes or have been crucial and important. I am not going to take up every case uh, of people, uh, let's say on the street. I am not going to do that under any circumstances. So this, I have to strike a balance between my commitment to dharma and my own professional standing and find a way to balance both. Uh, so as far as the PIL that you speak of is concerned, trust me, random people reach out to me on Instagram and other places saying, Sir, aap ye kyun karte, aap kyun, wo kyun karte. They don't understand what is the level at which I wish to operate at. 
I have written two books, each of which I can confidently say put together at least constitutes a single PhD thesis. And I've done so within a period of two years, spending six months and 12 days in the first book and six months and 21 days in the second book. <laughs> balancing my professional commitments. And I too have a life. People forget that. I have to do that as well. I bought two, those. You have to realize that when you go to court often for these causes, you're trying to address a symptom as opposed to the cause. Please understand this. What is it that the books have done? So people have asked me, Aapko case ladna tha, aapne book kyo likha? I'll give a very good answer to this. And I know why I did this exactly. This was thought through, this was very calculated. Because from 2016 to 2019, having participated in multiple dharmic matters, I could see a common problem across the board, which is that of institutional mindset. That the institutional mindset refused to look at the issue from a dharmic perspective. Because it was heavily buried under layers of coloniality. That's when I decided to write the book. When I was fighting the Padmanabha Swami case, we were looking at the instruments of accession of multiple princely states before they became part of the Indian Union. Each of the princely states was of religious character. Each of them had a titular deity. Mewad has Ekling Ji. Gajapati has Jagannath Ji. Travancore has Padmanabha Swami. Uh, Cochin has uh, Tripunitra. So there are multiple princely states with uh, 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 religious, of religious character. How did these multiple religious princely states give rise to a secular Bharat? The components are religious in nature, but the whole is apparently secular. How did that happen? What is this uh, trick I don't understand? So that's how I, I started looking at the entire issue. And then people said, given your research, you should put this in the form of a book. That's how I started working on the first book. And I'm, I'm very proud of, of making this point that the book has had an effect that 10 cases wouldn't have had. You know why? <laughs> Youngsters who were struggling to respond to allegations and stereotypes on campuses finally got the ammunition they needed to respond in those places. People who rubbished scholarship of the dharmic side as WhatsApp University were forced to shut their mouth. They were forced to shut their mouth because I said, next time you say WhatsApp University, I'll take you to the cleaners. Then you will see what I can do in court. Because that stereotype needed to be busted, that this is a non-intellectual side which has absolutely no brains. The only thing it's capable of doing is to wield the lati and shout Jai Shri Ram. No, Jai Shri Ram will come from the sophisticated voices of this community now. I made sure that in the most leftist of campuses, the moment I enter, the chants will start. Jai Shri Ram will start under any circumstances. So, re realize that some battles have to be fought in court and outside the court. And I think I'm well positioned to fight both these battles. I know the game of optics, I know the game of articulation, and I know the game of narrative building. I have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy. <laughs> it's a product of insomnia. So I have done so much to ensure that I, I'm prepared for this. So I will not take up every riffraff matter. <laughs> I'm very clear. There my professional ego will reign supreme, period. That's the hard line. That's the hard red line. Final question. Uh, so we can take one last question. Uh, Namaste, Sajid Pakshi. I'm uh, Anish Swami. I'm a recent uh, student graduate. Uh, I think, so my question alludes to a phrase I saw in one of the trailers earlier. It said, apologetic Hindus. So uh, I think you also alluded uh, to this in your re uh, answer right now. But especially in universities like you know, UC Berkeley in the Bay Area. I'm going tomorrow. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, any statement of support towards our dharma, you are, you know, you're just cast off and labeled as Modhi Bhakt or other such phrases. And I think that's why the student, uh, Hindu student body especially is very dissipated in almost every UC I've been to uh, in, right. in the entirety of California. Uh, and I've mainly seen that it's especially from Hindu students who come here from India, especially for their studies. So I actually dealt with a situation where uh, we were watching Kashmir Files with a huge group of friends. And the movie, the, the, the documentary was labeled as fiction and uh, because it was taken uh, and they took it too far because right. of the final scene in that movie. 
So obviously I was enraged at this, but I think the question I really want to be asking is, what is the best way you know, we can talk about and empower our culture within universities without being you know, cast aside or coming off as defensive, afraid, or apologetic, along with empowering other Hindus to not shy away from their own dharma? There's a university in Sonipat, uh, a few kilometers away from Delhi, called the Ashoka University. So 2018, I was invited for a lecture by a group of Indic-minded students who obviously were in the minority, but who still had the guts to invite me and suffer the consequences of that invitation. I told them very clearly, I don't want any invitation that comes at the expense of your careers. So please feel free to cancel this invitation. To me, it wouldn't make a difference whatsoever. I will not mind it one bit. But I will not live with the guilt of having destroyed careers of students merely because it was a speaking opportunity for me. So I told them as much. The boys and girls were so brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They said, no matter what, we want you here because we are unable to live with the bile that is spewed against our culture and religion on this campus with institutional support. Okay? So I said, okay, fine, you've taken a decision and I hope you know what you're doing. I decided to go there. So there were posters all over the place, Brahmin go back. Brahmin go back. People speak of jati discrimination, what do you call this? <laughs> Except that we don't have a legislation to support us. So this is what it, 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 it actually, there were posters all over the place saying Brahmin go back. I said, okay, koi farak nahi padta. I'll wear my saffron kurta and go, I wore my saffron kurta. <laughs> and I had a conversation. Uh, with a room full, maybe about, it was about 200 to 250 students in a classroom. Uh, I was being given lectures on how the majority must all, you know, never punch down, must, uh, and the minority has the right to punch up and all that. I said, what kind of imported nonsense it is, this country which is uh, exporting this kind of garbage. So, uh, I had a conversation and I, I made sure that at no point of time I was seen as being diffident or whatever it is. I stuck, my, I stuck to my guns, I presented uh, whatever I felt were facts based on material. Perhaps what I'm trying to tell you is, if you're looking for an easy, non-confrontational way out of this battle, it doesn't exist at least yet. It doesn't exist yet. I have been facing this since 2002. I entered the portals of engineering in 2002, finished in 2006, 2006 to 2009 uh, was in IIT Kharagpur. 2006 to 2009 in IIT Kharagpur, there was a congress appointee who was made the director of uh, IIT Kharagpur, who out of the blue decided to abolish the concept of vegetarian messes, vegetarian halls altogether. And uh, the decision made no rhyme or reason, it made no sense whatsoever because it had been there all along. We said. One vegetarian mess, what do you lose? Who is it affecting? So, uh, ISKCON devotees and all of us, they, uh, they came to me and they said, Sir, you have to do something, you have to talk about it. So we went and we spoke. And this is in Khadakpur, West Bengal. <laughs> so, I said, okay. Okay. Lalko Bhagwa Jawab to Milega Milega. So I basically asked a simple question. If I were of a different community and I said that my sentiments were hurt by a certain decision that you've taken, would you have dealt with us in the same dismissive nature? He's like, why are you getting political? I said, I'm not getting political at all. I am asking you a question. I'm happy to put this question in writing through a representation. And for days we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and finally we managed to retain that one mess. Then in 2008 or 9, I happened to invite a member of a cultural organization to the campus uh, for a lecture. So the campus has a newspaper called Scholars Avenue. Uh, it's based on Harvard's Crimson Avenue or whatever it is. So. Articles were written as to how I am a bigot and this and all that, and I am starting a Hindutva movement on the campus and whatnot. 
So that situation has not changed. But I'll tell you what has changed. The power of social media to change the mainstream narrative did not exist in my time. Because you see, Facebook came out in 2004, and I think Twitter was just about beginning. And it, these platforms hadn't gained the kind of traction and power to challenge mainstream narratives as they do today, or maybe over the last decade and a half. We have seen all of that. Okay, but forget us. What about the generation before that? They've had the worst of times. They've had the worst of times possible. I would say draw heart from the fact that previous generations have had it worse. You're actually better off in terms of tools of dissemination to present your own narrative. Mm -hmm. And you have voices today which are public and vocal, which will support you from outside at the very least. Count your blessings. Don't look for an easy way out. It's not going to be easy. But this is a staring contest. Try not to blink. The, the tide will turn. It will turn. We have come this far. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that my books will be published by Bloomsbury or Vikram Sudhu public or books will be published by Penguin at one point. Mm -hmm. We were persona non grata right. or persona non grata. We wouldn't have been allowed access to any of these portals at all. Mm -hmm. That has also changed. It has changed thanks to the sacrifice of all those unsung people before us. Not because of our solo efforts. People who managed to keep kicking at the door on a regular basis, finally the door opened. Okay? So my only suggestion to you is draw courage from your ancestors. Cultivate a spiritual practice which will keep you strong when the wind is blowing strong around you. You will not, you will not allow yourself to be affected by this and that is not going to come from outside. If people think that popularity on social media is going to help people deal with situations when they are directly in the line of fire, no it does not. What helps you deal with situations is your spiritual dharmic grounding on a regular basis. That's the only thing that keeps you strong. And this is a fight for commitment to your faith. That is the ultimate test. That is the ultimate test. That When, when reduced to the brass tracks, this is the only issue. Mm -hmm. So find a way to couple it with the previous question of having a regular spiritual practice that strengthens your spine and your brain on a regular basis and sharpens your tongue. Thank you.